So, I think it's time. Um, thank you for being here for uh, what I think is almost the last talk of, of the conference. Yeah, um, I, I've been told I have to explain that joke for the stream, so uh, that joke uh, is actually a French mistake uh, that originated uh, in a murder case where the, peop the person who was murdered actually wrote, wrote with her own blood uh, pointing to the, the, the assassin. It was Omar Mathieu. And um, the problem with that is that it, it has a French mistake that she would never have made. So it pointed to, to a person who went to prison, and apparently later in the, in the history of that case, he was freed. Hence the title that I, at least I found funny. So uh, this talk is about uh, why I tried to kill the LSP. So I'm, I'm going to see some details uh, about that. But first, uh, who am I? Um, Regarding LSP, I'm maintaining the LSP package since uh, 2012. Um, since 2010, I'm the Debian printing maintainer, so sole founder and actually the more or less alone package maintainer. And since March 2015, I'm a member of the Debian technical committee and the current chair. But let's go to the beefy part of the, the talk. The, so we're going to talk a little about the Linux standard base or familiarly called the LSP. But what is it really? So I thought it would be interesting to go look what the Linux Foundation actually says about the, the LSP. So the goal of the LSP is to develop and promote a set of open standards that will increase compatibility among Linux distributions and enable software applications to run on any compliant system, even in binary form. We'll come back to that. In addition, the LSP will help coordinate efforts to recruit software vendors to port and write products for Linux operating systems. It's actually a quite old project. The first version of the, that standard was uh, published in June 2001, and um, the last version more recently, two years ago in June 2015. It's actually a wide set of standards. Uh, I didn't go and print, this, despite my vast interest in printing, uh, I didn't go and print the LSP standards because um, it's actually a big, big book. Um, but the important thing there is, is to highlight uh, what actually the goal is uh, in terms of in terms of for, for the Linux Foundation. So the goal is, of the LSP is to enable software application to run on any compliant system, even in binary form. And that's actually the interesting part about the LSP. This is just a, a graph uh, that's from the LSP documentation or the LSP Wikipedia page, I think. That explains that uh, we have everything on the Linux kernel side that they can break the things internally, but they guarantee uh, uh, stability on the API side, and we kind of have the same for the, the software, and that was the, the previous thing they want, didn't want to have, and then they could have what Motion Builder, Siemens, Enix, Katia 5, Maya, etc., that could be compiled against LSP and run on any Linux OS Alpha, Bravo, or Charlie. The LSP itself is, is five different aspects, actually. It has the, um, the file system hierarchy standard, things about the system initialization, in which Debian has an opinion there. Um, the LSP release, the binary compatibility itself, and the Red Hat package format. We'll come back to that. So I'll, I'll go through these five aspects so that you understand the, the coverage of the LSP. So the F FHS uh, describes what we want to see in all LSP compliant uh, Linux uh, distributions. So these are the ones, I won't read them because you, you know them. But the, where LSP is especially picky is that it describes quite in detail exactly what we want to see and where. So uh, we have of course home and root and mount and SRV and slash opt. But then in slash USR we also have all these plus, so I think I've met all of these, but then you have things like slash var, slash lib, slash hw clock. I didn't know that existed. Um, what? Okay. So, um, and it describes for each of these directories what they are for, uh, what the rights are expected on these directories, if they are mandatory or optional on a, on a Linux system. And of that, um, in Debian, we actually amend it because there are parts of the FHS we don't necessarily agree with or we have special use cases. Um, for example, multi-arch, we have dif different exceptions to the FHS. So we are, Debian is not FHS compliant. 
Debian is Debian policy compliant. And regarding the versions, we currently have the version 2.3 with some amend amendments. If you fancy that, please go read the section 911 of Debian policy. It's actually probably an A4 page uh, of exceptions. And there is an open bug to actually migrate to the 3.0 version, uh, bug 787816, if you're interested. So that's for the files. Uh, the files is, is an area where it's quite easy to agree. Then we move to init systems. So um, there is a whole chapter about init system, and in particular it's chapter 22. And it describes the cron jobs, how they work, the init script actions, the comment conventions for init scripts, etc. etc. And that's exactly what you would see, for example, in etc init cups. And it's these uh, provides cups and it requires syslog and remote fs to start. It should probably start the network, the Avahi dem daemon, the slapd, etc. etc. So that's what we had in CSV init. And that's the comments that were actually read by the um, inserve to actually try to do parallel booting. That is not LSP compliant, but it's quite faster, so we do that, we do that instead. But it also describes a set of functions that you can use in an init, uh, in an init script. The goal of that is that you enable, therefore you enable someone who wants to write an init script for a proprietary system to actually know what interfaces they can use. So you have start daemon, kill proc, pid of proc, and various log messages. That's for the init functions. If you want to go read the LSP, please do it. Um, there's also LSP release, that's actually a binary uh, that you can run. And if you run it, um, it will tell you what LSP modules you have, what is the operating system you're running in, what is this reader ID, what release, what code name. And it's widely used in various scripts to actually detect if that, in this, if that uh, shell script is running on Red Hat or Debian or which version. And actually, nowadays, you should really depend on, on functionalities and not version numbers, but that's still what everyone does. Um, but LSP release is just one of the binaries that you need on an LSP compliant system. Actually, it says it goes through a very, very long list of uh, binaries that are mandatory on an LSP system. Uh, batch, PC, I didn't know of call, for example, but yeah, I didn't go through all the list. So actually it defines 62 mandatory commands. And then we have the, the ABI, so that's, that's the more complex stuff. Uh, binary compatibility. So it, it goes in details in multiple base libraries. So you have libc, libm, libdthread, libgcc, etc. You also have utility libraries, libz, lib and curses. And you would think, oh, well, that's, that's enough. But it goes on and on. So you have uh, the X network security services, you have libx11, you have libice, etc., etc. So actually, there are quite a lot of libraries that are mandated. And I took one specific example so that you understand why it's quite boring to read the standards, uh, but also in which detail it goes. So if we take uh, libz, for example, it says in chapter 15.2, it says this is the name of the library. It has that so name, and it has these various interfaces, Adler32, Compress, etc. So if we go see what Compress does, it says, so here comes the, the function synopsis, so it starts with a byte f destination, a u long f destination length, etc., etc. has a description and some constraints on what the output does, what the input does, and what exactly does this, the function will do. And it has this verbose descriptions for all the functions in all the libraries that are documented. And if you see the numbers, it's actually 25,000 constants that are described in the LSP standard. It's uh, 36,000 binary interfaces that are described in various details, etc., etc. So it's quite a lot. And apparently there was hope. I found this, this article the other day. New slash from IBM in 272. The problem is solved. Linux has taken the next evolutionary step beyond the source code compatibility of Unix. Instead of porting or rebuilding source code from one Linux release or distribution to another, Linux has achieved binary compatibility between them all. <laughs> so we could have just stopped in 2002, right? Um, but of course, uh, there are other things that are slightly more confusing for people like us, is that uh, LSP mandates that you have an RPM binary that 
works on your machine. So it does not require the implementation to use RPM as the package manager. It only specifies the format of the package file and requires that implementations must have some method of installing conforming packages. Uh, I could go into much more details about what the LSD is, but you're probably more interested in, in what we have done actually in Debian. So in Debian, um, we've had, had uh, multiple packages to actually try to go in the direction of having LSP support. Um, the first one was Alien. Who has used Alien recently? Wow. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> so it, it was introduced in 1997, just in time for both. And uh, it converts RPM packages to dev packages, and I think it also converts dev packages back to RPM packages. Um, and the, its point is that it also will try to do things with the dependencies and depend on LSD core, current version, or LSD this current version. But we also introduced the LSD package in 2002 in time for Voodoo version 3. So in, in July 2002 for Woody, we had uh, LSD 1.1.0 at the time. And there was a separate binary package for LSP release. And there was just one LSP binary package. This package provides an implementation of version 111.110 of the Linux based for Debian on this only architecture with the Linux kernel. But I have highlighted that part about it, I think it was in the news file or in the changelog. It's one of the first com com compromises that Debian has done about the LSP, um, and we'll see more of that later. So LSP 1.1 assumes a 2.4 kernel, but Debian ships a 2.2 kernel, so we're not compatible. But we still have some sort of layer to actually try to do it, but we're not. Then in Sarge, after a very long freeze, June 2005, uh, we had LSP 2.0, and uh, LSP release was reintegrated in the LSP source package, and we had LSP, LSP base, core graphics, and CXX. And it was the first appearance of that longer message that says that this intent, the intent of this package is to provide a best current practice way of installing LSP packages on Debian. Its presence does not imply that I or the Debian project believe that Debian fully complies with the LSP. And it should not be construed as a statement that Debian is LSP compliant. We'll come back to that later as well. Um, and as a slight diversion, I'll also take a little time to talk about the LSD base package. Who has the LSD base package installed in the machine? Well, you should all raise your hands, you will see why. <laughs> um, so this package only includes some init functions that are mandated by the by LSD. So a little shell library may be used by other packages initialization, initialization scripts for console logging and other purposes. And it came along with um, it came along well with sysvnit um, in September 2005. Sysvnit started to use the LSB base functions and therefore depended on LSB base. And in February 2006, it actually modified the init script templates that everyone was copy and pasting to create new init scripts to actually use the init functions. So if you take a look at the popcorn graph of LSB base, you see that at some point there is a change and that kind of means that since 2009 everyone has LSB based installed. As soon as you have one, one reasonably complex in a script and or CSV in it's installed, you have LSB base. Which makes it a quite scary package to maintain, I can say. Um, so you know, going on through the releases in Debian Edge 4.0 in April 2007, we introduced new packages, LSB Desktop and LSB Qt 4. And in 2009, we had LSP32. And uh, at that point in time, kind of started the long and slow ossification of that package. Because it was quite actively maintained by Chris Lawrence before, from 2002 to 2011, after a stretch freeze. But he had other things in life and couldn't continue to maintain it. Is it squeeze or stretch? Yeah. It's probably squeeze, uh, squeeze, yes. Squeeze was frozen in 2010. Oh, yes. And there's a mistake on that slide as well. <laughs> That's what you get when you dive in history. Um, so when Squeeze uh, released in February 2011, uh, we were still, so the only support, 
<laughs> the only support we had was uh, LED 3.2, despite the fact that three years before we had LSD 4 that, that was released. So there was basically three years in which nothing happened uh, on the LSD front for Debian. And as you know, we have a famous, uh, uh, famous distribution who was already maintaining a different pile of code to try to achieve LSP compatibility on their own. Uh, so Ubuntu, since 2004, had people working on an LSP uh, compatibility layer. So in 2009, when we had version 3.2, they had already the 4.0 LSP compatibility layer for Karmic. And then came Hope. Or I just made, I just adopted the package. Um, so in 2012, I, I saw that the LSD package had some bugs, so I started to do some NMUs and prepare the package for Wheezy. Wee. Wheezy. Wee. <laughs> Many mistakes. And one of the one of the part of my job was to <laughs> was to backport some of the Ubuntu modifications. And of course, we had different opinions of how PDF proc should go find its little bits here and there to find what the bit of a process could, should be. And I don't think we ever managed to actually merge that pro properly because uh, it's quite hard to test all the little corner cases. But we back backported quite a lot of the Ubuntu modifications, in particular things like the LSD invalid MTA to make sure that you don't actually have an MTA on your machine but you can pretend that you do. And as I said before, as everyone has LSD base, it's kind of scary to upload a new uh, shell init functions thing that you have tested only on your own machine. And I'm not a super shell script man, so I was kind of it's kind of scary to like deep put that and hope that not all the people come to my home and try to find me. But it's a very good learning experience and may, uh, being able to make a change on so many machines at once is, is, is interesting. So part of the work I did was to migrate to LSP 4.1. I, I also added tests for the Python code because it was not tested. And the left info blocks. Does, one, does anyone know what I'm referring to by left info blocks? Yes. yes. Um, actually, it's a thing I'm, I'm quite proud of because it's a, it was a very visible change in Wheezy. So that's what we had on other systems. So you notice the, the green OK boxes on the right. And we figured it's not OK on the right, it's much more fun on the left. So, well, the reason was uh, people were starting to have big screens. So and we had a bootlog that had like 20 centimeters between your message and the error that was kind of confusing. So we just said, yeah, probably it's better on the, on the left. It's not a big change, but it's, it's also funny to see that appear on various people's systems. But there's also the time for the first compromises, as we saw the other one before uh, about the kernel. Uh, actually, Q3 was not released in, in Wheezy, but it's still mandatory for LSB 4.1, which was the LSB release at the time. So that was the news entry. Um, that, that was explaining that we had an explicit and Debian specific derogation from the LSP41 specification, and if you wanted to have an LSP package uh, that needed Q3, you needed to go find it in Snapshot, basically. Um, but if you look at the dates, it's 2012, and Q3 was deprecated since 2005, and that's that's a quite long time in the. <laughs> in the history of, of software, I mean, seriously. So, and then came a uh, disappointment. From the distribution point of view, um, LSB is interesting because it's a single go-to code for system initialization. It was before systemd, of course. Uh, because you had one place where you could put logging functions and PDF proc things and all the things that everyone has to re-implement on their own <coughs> in one single place. So at, at one point in the package history we started to add more functions there and try to convince the, the various maintainers of init scripts to, set to, to, to tell them, look, don't do that complicated thing on your own, just use that code. It's tested, everyone uses it. So LSB based init functions are interesting for that from the Debian point of view. We're also shipping something that everyone expects on any Linux system, that is LSB release. And it doesn't necessarily make sense to remove it. 
And we had some packages to serve proprietary software. LSB Core, LSB Desktop, for example. There are various packages out there that just expect that to exist. Um, but then came a new init system. New init system D. Gee, that's... <laughs> I'll fix that. <laughs> um, so, systemd came and it's not at all mentioned in LSB. And LSB assumes that you have sysv in it. But if you have sysv in it present but it doesn't run sysv in it, then the LSB kind of conflicts with that. So you're supposed to keep sysv in it uh, around or, or keep it running while Debian was starting to move towards systemd. And for Rio, I mean, I searched. I really tried to find LSB compliant packages. The only ones that are of reasonable use by people that use Debian or Ubuntu is Google Earth and some very old Epson printer drivers. And I'm yet to see any other. And the interesting question there is, currently the distribution of proprietary software happens in different ways. Um, if you work in the web, you see these wget things pipe sudo bash a lot. Yeah. That's scary. But trust me, a lot of people do that. And actually when people want to ship software, what they do is they do a dev package that kind of runs on, on an old version of Ubuntu and or an old version of Debian and they do an RPM that will mostly work <laughs> here and there. And there are some containers. What? The no check certificate. Ah, yes. Well, actually, <laughs> the no check certificate has, is disappearing slowly and slowly, but it was in the documentation all the time. No, but it's HTTP. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's because example.com doesn't have HTTPS. <laughs> um, so the problem is that we've kind of done half the job. And um, we're mostly there, but the FHS has exceptions in the Debian policy, and Debian is not LSB certified. So what's what's the point of all that? Talking about the certification, uh, there is a distribution checker, and apparently it's possible to run it. It runs tests for ten hours and will test all the binaries and all the things. But the real question is to be asked there is. For what goal, for what purpose would we do that? And have other distribution done that, done that? Because if no one does, why would we? So I checked, and apparently there are three LSB 4.0 certified um, distributions, Oracle 6, uh, RHEL 6, and Ubuntu 9. That's eight years ago. And only uh, Red Hat Enterprise version 7 is LSB 4.1 certified. And Ubuntu stopped being certified, and Oracle is, has not uh, tried to get certified either. So, um, when, it, when it came to me, I, I figured I'd, rather than just taking LSP away, I, I'd do it the Debian way and try to discuss that. So I had a first buff at DevCon 14 in Portland, and from the room what I got was, uh, no one cares, just remove it. So, um, and then it took a long time for me to actually write my thoughts to Debian Devil and Debian LSP. And the answers were, if I got them, no one cares. So, I figured we should pull the plug on that. And here's actually my thoughts that were taken also by um, LWN. And I think it's still valid. The crux of the issue is, I think, whether the whole game is worth the work. I'm yet to hear about software distribution happening through LSP packages. Back then when the LSP certified applications list was online, <laughs> I tried to check it this morning, it was down, um, there were only eight applications by six different companies ever certified for LSP. And only one of these was certified for a version of LSP that was older than four. So the three points there is that Debian doesn't verify LSP compatibility and has never done so. And a part of the argument there is that it's fine to say we have a state of distribution that is compliant.
But if you have to do a security upgrade and it breaks some ABI somewhere for a very good reason, then we, instant, we would instantly become non-compliant. So we'd have lost all the work because we would have valued security over LSP compliance. So it's kind of pointless if we cannot guarantee that over the course of any security problem we would stay compliant. Furthermore, only Red Hat's doing it. And whenever we talked about that in Debian Devil, at DevConf, on Debian LSP, whatever other channels, on the uh, LWN comments, no one except, expects Debian to actually do it. Another problem is that it's not like we're a big team maintaining an LSP compatibility layer across the archive. I'm, I was the only one, and I'm not interested in LSP, I was just interested in fixing bugs for Wheezy and making sure LSP didn't have uh, RC bugs. So I figured, I should still leave the door open if there is interest, because that's how Debian works. I, rather than just orphaning it, I could just hand out the package to someone saying, look, I can help you do the licensing effort. So I wrote on the Debian Devil and Debian LSP list saying, we could be certified. I'm welcoming patches, but I will not lead the effort. So if you want to adopt it, I'll help you get up to speed with that, and you can do it. And I waited three months and I received zero responses. Too short. It's way too short, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I took my chainsaw out and um, I removed uh, all the packages we had, besides the ones that I could not really remove. LSB base will need a long transition period before we can remove, remove it, and LSB release kind of makes sense because it's embedded in plenty of scripts all around the place, so it doesn't make sense to remove it. So the answer from the Linux Foundation, or the answer from the LSP side was, oops, no, was nothing. I had a, something working there. Yeah. So that's the end of the day, right? But unfortunately, we had to somehow plug the plug back. Because of the things I mentioned before, Google Earth, it's kind of nice if we can install it on the stretch, stable release. And the Epson drivers are proprietary. We don't necessarily want to have a sort of, of, um, of script that takes them and unmangles and remangles them to make them installable. So we figure, figured if there are devs out there that depend on LSD core, then we could do something. So I held, I held above uh, last year in Cape Town. Uh, about that, uh, with some ideas, um, and so for Stretch, the idea is that I reintroduce the new package that is LSB Compact, uh, with a version that is not linked to the LSB version on purpose, and this, the idea was that we provide LSB core and LSB, but we just add the libjpeg or the this and, or this or this dependencies that are enough for the dev packages that we know. So there was a news entry, I think, that said, if it doesn't work for you and you have a package that depends on LSP, please write us and we add dependencies. So that was like, we fall back to the minimal layer we can find. And there was the question, are there others that need of that? And again, no answer. So yeah, it's not the best technical solution because I, obviously the best technical solution is that Google says, oh cool, uh, we don't have to depend on LSD, we can actually depend on the correct version of libjpeg or the correct version of libjl or something. But there, it's not free software, so it's not our problem. So there was, I, then I emailed the, the announce for this uh, the list and um, I was, I didn't want to say the LSB is dead immediately, so I said, we're not throwing all, all of the LSB overboard, we're still firmly standing behind the FHS and our CSVNet scripts mostly conform to LSP. And I was expecting some answers to that, but I was overwhelmingly surprised by just support basically, saying people saying, yeah, it's fine. So yeah, I mixed my slides, so the answer from the LSP was, Science. <laughs> <laughs> so the question uh, is also what happens next. So in Buster, I had a, an image of a dog here. Anyway, it was a cute dog. So the idea is that we hit the final nails, nails in the coffin 
for LSP. So I just I just made a LSP based non essential. So if you need it, just depend on it, and it will be installed. But it's not installed by default. And I just removed LSP compact. Um, I'm not very good at that, but maybe I should communicate slightly more about it rather than just removing packages and have a change log entry. Um, there's the idea of having communication in the release notes, maybe. I think there was something in the stretch release notes about it will be deprecated soon. But maybe we should communicate more about that. Maybe we should also talk to Google and Epson saying, look, your package is not going to work on the next stable release. So please fix your things. And maybe we should communicate to the world, or make sure LWN just notices and does an article for us. If there's an LWN? <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, back to the introduction, actually, that was in the talk description. Um, is removing LSB, uh, making the LSB obsolete, or is that the final nails in Debian's coffin? So, my opinion there is that the LSB is long dead. Despite good intentions, it just didn't survive reality. That is, um, for applications, as we said before, um, free software applications are just not shipped using the LSB anyway. Uh, you would use a PPA if Ubuntu has that package. You could use Snaps, Flatpak, Image, App Image, and all the recent things to have uh, applications distributed. Or you, can, or you can still use the wget thing, with or without the certificate checking. Also, systemd is now reality, and I think it has a mention in the, the LSB5, but it's not yet like the way, the modern way of doing in its systems. And containers, I mean, if you want to have uh, Googlers, probably the best way to do it is like find the Docker recipe for that, launch it, and it just works. Five minutes of downloading things from the internet, and it just works. And the point of having an LSB core that depends on a very old version of libjpg and that you have to take Qt3 from snapshots is not really uh, practical. Then on the side of distributions, there's the point that um, the standards is what is in production and not the inverse. So we are not building Debian to fit whatever LSB thinks is a good Linux operating system. The LSB is trying to encode in a document what uh, our experience has shown is a good uh, Linux system. So it comes to the point that the standardization process for the LSB has been way too slow. Um, it would have been ideal if they had multiple updates in a stable release cycle and then we could have considered like if we had a, a vivid conversation with them saying oh we'll have that in the next stable release so if you could update the standard then we could be all on the same line. But it was quite slow. Binary compatibility, uh, we all had fun about that at uh, the start of the talk, is a chimera. It's just, it's, we know how to build software and make it run, and we know it's kind of hard to make that run everywhere. And we don't want to all do Java. But there are surprising things that happen. Apparently nowadays you can run Ubuntu via binaries on Windows, so it's not impossible. And there is also the, the point that we might have foreseen uh, initially is that corporate backed distros have a direct interest to keep their clients captive. That means that Canonical has an interest to have people actually use PPAs and use things that work on Ubuntu because that makes it more popular. Uh, Red Hat or Fedora have an interest to make sure that people can easily create RPMs because that makes their distribution more popular. And no one is really backing the idea of the LSB with uh, how good it could work. And innovation was not happening on the LSD side, it was happening in, in these distributions, and PPAs are a good innovation for that. The other side of the coin is that we don't need the LSD. Debian does not need the LSD. Our role, the, the Debian's role in the Floss ecosystem is established now. Maybe it was not at the time of LSD 1.0, but nowadays people are, have heard much more about Debian than they have heard about LSD applications. <coughs> Ubuntu, uh, with its PPAs, has, have also vastly democratized the Debian packaging. Much, many more people actually do Debian packaging. They might not do it as we would like them to do it, but it happens. And we see binary packages on PPAs, and then we, you have the, all the automated buildd, blah, 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 and it, you can just install that and it mostly works. 
And this fantasy of having one single LSD world on top of all the distributions is not, it's just not how it works nowadays. So you would do either both an RDEP or R and an RPM package, or you would do either of those. But it's a reality now that you have to do one DEB and one RPM at the very least, if you want to ship to users. So some closing thoughts. I think I'm quite on time. I'm surprised. Maybe I'll talk too <coughs> quickly. Um, so giving up on the LSP, I think, is a, is a way to push everyone to package for Debian directly. So for free software, it's obvious we have to bring people to Debian, they package, they package their thing, and we ship that as a stable release. But that's our view of the world, so it might not fit all application shipping purposes. We need to be supportive of the modern ways that are worked on to <coughs> ship software to our users, and um, LSD is not that. Nowadays we have to face it. Uh, LSD is not that smart in way. It kind of has never been. We could have been if, if there were a much more closer relationship, but it has not been. It has always been lagging behind what we were doing on the innovative way to ship software. But there is still this concern that we're not bringing the Debian magic to fast ecosystems, to the NPM ecosystem, to the Python ecosystem, to the Ruby ecosystem. We just depend on other external ways to ship applications to our users and we just live with that. So as a provocative uh, final thought, I think it's important to remind that that is not about TPKJ or APT. It just happens to be our best implementation of our dream vision now. But I just tried to formulate my thoughts then as I think it's important to remind that Devin is about crafting the best technical arrangement to ship the free software that satisfies our criteria as widely as possible. If that's currently implemented by DPKJ and APT, it's fine. But we need to have the, the mental agility to think about what are the best ways to actually provide uh, Debian free software guideline approved software to our users in the most efficient way. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Hey DDA, um, awesome talk, great story, good description of what's happened, you have compelling arguments, I think you're doing exactly the right thing, really good stuff. Thank um, you. I do have direct experience of the LSB process myself, when we were bootstrapping RHF um, three cycles ago, um, I got involved, there was a sort of discussion as to whether or not we should add ARM as an architecture to the LSB because some proprietary people might need it. Um, so I got involved in some of the regular conference calls, we started working through the process, and that was when I realised that LSB was dead. Um, <laughs> it was basically doomed to, there were a few reasons, and you've already you, you picked up on several of them. Um, Red Hat were paying lip service and nothing more because exactly, they didn't want to make it possible for people to run proprietary apps on other systems, they wanted people to run, run it all on Red Hat. Um, there were never enough people involved in the LSB to be able to keep going. So it's not just a, they don't care, they're not talking to us. Just like you, you're a single maintainer. I, I saw there were essentially three, maybe four people involved, and they had a vast amount of work to do. So they, when I was looking at it, they were talking about QT4 and then QT5, with this vast amount of work to do, knowing full well that they'd never get there. Um, it's a crying shame. It, was, it seemed like a really nice idea at the time when they started in 2002. Um, it's dead, let's go <coughs> the way. Thank you. Hi, Didier. Um, I concur with Steve. Um, I too have a history of sitting in on some LSB conference calls. Um, and I can only say, I, I don't know what his time frame was. I think it was a bit after me. But it certainly looked the same there. And a lot of what slowed them down was the fact that they were also trying to go to ISO and synchronize with them. Um, and the ISO has its own massive bureaucracy to deal with. And it was a handful of people at LSB trying to cope with that. Um, but the main point I wanted to uh, 
emphasize here is that I've seen a lot written on LWN in particular about how, I mean, to, to kind of, to, to sing the praises of Deepackage and, and, to, and to a lesser extent apt, um, it seems like a lot of these groups that, that seek to circumvent the tedium of going through a distributor, um, as for instance OpenSSL famously complained about, um, they end up tackling the package, uh, the packaging problem because, well, you know, by God, they're going to do it right this time. And they rapidly run into the same problems that RPM and Dpackage ran into years ago and found solutions for. Um, so perhaps, you know, the, the, there was an interesting talk the other day on, on, on containers and flat packs and, and, and stuff like that. But perhaps what we can best do to interface with these communities is not so much find ways to repack what they're doing, um, but to help communicate the knowledge and hard-won wisdom we've obtained by attacking these difficult problems. Um, just to point out one of the most notorious is, is that um, you know, the package dependency graph is um, directed and cyclic. Um, we all, those of us who study CS in our undergraduate years spend a lot of time with acyclic graphs, but cycles are a real pain in the butt to deal with. And that was one of the big problems uh, I believe Jason Gunthorpe had to solve uh, with apt. Um, that's just one example of the kind of real painful um, experience that we've learned from and solved, and that maybe we can help these other communities. Um, and in the, and, you know, in the meantime, perhaps a good relationship with them will lead us to uh, a closer technical working relationship um, so that things aren't completely gross for people wanting to uh, run NPM or PIP on a Debian machine. Yeah, thank you very much. What is the status of snap packages in Debian? I don't know. I think, from what I've heard, I think you can find snapd packages to install on Debian and then run snaps, but I'm not sure it works in main now. But if anyone from the room has more information there, all welcome. So my understanding is they can sort of work and like most of the bits are in Debian, but um, the sandboxing is like absent because it relies on getting a farmer upstreamed. I could be wrong about this, this is second hand, Snap is not the one I work on, but that is my understanding. Okay, thanks. Many. Hi Didier, I had two questions for you. Um, so thanks for this nice talk, the historical side of the story uh, was quite interesting, uh, once you get your slides fixed. Um, so I didn't know about the distribution checker, uh, so for now we rely uh, on the auto packages tests on hundreds of users to test the distribution, etc. Uh, did you test it? And if yes, did you did it help you to find bugs in some packages? I looked at it and probably spent two three hours figuring figu figuring out if I needed a VM or in what way I could just not explode my laptop with that, because by definition the distribution checker will do all sorts of things across your machine. And then I stopped. So I didn't invest more than that. Fair enough. But I'm looking forward for anyone to do. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so as you said, LSB is dead. Uh, you're not willing to invest more time in it, so I won't be losing your time with LSB. Uh, so I had another question. Uh, I, th I know you're the TC chair. You're not eligible yet. But will you try to make uh, yourself nominate uh, to the next DPL elections? I think we're out of time, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, to answer that differently to that question, I, I'm not sure the deeper role is the best to address that. I think it's a conversation we should all have to find ways, to find technical ways to bring the, the Debian good things across the, the space. But yeah, fair question. <laughs> Simon. So, um, Something I think we can potentially learn from the LSB is um, one of the things that they, they do in the distribution checker is um, like checking the behavior and the ABI of various functions. 
and I'd like to see some of the other side of this from like the GNOME community, for instance, because GTK is one of the libraries they test. And so some of the tests for GTK, it turns out, the LSB checks that there is particular behavior, and the GTK developers look at it and go, that's not what we meant, that's a bug, we should fix that. Um, but so, you know, if, if we're testing for particular behavior, uh, we should like talk to our upstreams and check that the behavior, we're, the, the behavior we're asserting is actually what they wanted. Yes, I would welcome more automated testing. <laughs> Good. Thank you everyone for your attention and have a nice trip back because soon the end.